Hello and welcome to News Click. We are going to take a look at the economic survey which has been presented today. And I have with me Poranjay Gohathakutta to discuss the issues. Poranjay, if you look at the economic survey, of course, it's early, uh, just been presented. So it's a thick document. document. It's three thick two documents. But going through all of that, you know, a quick glance at it, it seems to have set the first part of the economic survey, focusing on how Nehru and socialism is, was wrong. And instead, we should go back to our Artha Shastra, as well as the Adam Smith's, uh, the invisible hand of the market, and how this is now a according to the economic survey, by shown by the few years that the Modi government has been in power. So do you think that's a fair uh, uh, comment on what I see on in the economic survey right at the beginning? I, I think it's a fairly good summary of what has been expounded in considerable detail by the chief economic advisor in the Ministry of Finance, is uh, Krishnamurti Subramaniam. And, uh, a special attempt has been made to highlight what you and I would describe as right-wing, pro-market, capitalist policies and at the same time debunking the bad old days of socialism, so to say, and at the same time trying to offer a critique of the all the... the, the all those who have been criti criticizing the government's policies on whether or not our rate of growth of gross domestic product has been overstated, overestimated. They said no. Then they said government intervention actually undermines markets and hurts more than it helps. That's that's the uh, chapter four, the headline. And it says no, we were not opposed to government intervention, but what has happened is excessive government intervention. Then again, without naming uh, Ambani and Adani, it says that the way forward is pro-business versus pro-crony. And also, my business rather than your business friends. And in, in who's a crony and who's, who's, who's crony? Because you see, Porja, just to interrupt at this point, the point is we are seeing concentration in the hands of few accelerating over the last 10, 15, 20 years. So this is not uh, pro-market, meaning more competition, but it is pro-market, meaning concentration of monopoly power in the hands of the few. And that has not decelerated in this government. In fact, it is accelerating. You know, what is actually important is what has not been said. So just as in the chapter, the third chapter, which is a pro-business versus pro-crony, no specific instances have been made and let, let me just you know come specifically to certain points to highlight why what has not been said is equally important it says pro crony policies as reflected in discretionary allocation of natural resources till 2011 rent led to rent seeking by beneficiaries while competitive allocation of the same resources post 2014 have put an end to such rent extraction Similarly, crony lending that led to willful default when promoters have collectively siphoned off wealth from banks led to losses that dwarf subsidies directed towards rural development. It's as if before 2014, everything was terrible. And after 2014, suddenly, hunky-dory, everything is fine. And I'll, I'll give you a, a, another uh, a, example. You know, for instance, he's tried to link what the complication, I mean, the, all the complexities of economics, all the, uh, the regressions, the equations, to at the end of it, thalinomics. The economics of a plate of food in India begins with a quote from the Rig, Rig Veda and ends up saying that if you look at what has happened between 2006-7 and 2019-20, then the, 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 uh, the, the affordability of a vegetarian thali as well as a non-vegetarian thali. It's gone up by 29% for vegetarian thali and non-vegetarian thali. Once again, you're taking a big span because it suits you at that particular point Five to compare 2006-7 with 2019-18. But you're not looking at what has happened. And what's also significant, 
And maybe I missed it, but I didn't find anything about inequality. Now, of course, uh, if you say pro-wealth creators, this question is not that the wealth creators are people working in the factories or other people. It's really wealth creators are those who own the company. Correct. And, that, and, and, but I'll, I'll come to this yes. just a minute later. But uh, and, and talking about inequality, etc., leaving that out as you have raised. You know, the key issue right now facing all of us seems to be the fact that there is a huge deceleration of the economy. Now, that, at least in the parts that we have read till now, we don't seem to find that as referenced. It is not that everybody has been talking about the slowdown of the manufacturing sector. We also do not talk, it doesn't seem to talk about the fact that we have stagnation in manufacturing, if not drop, coupled with inflation, particularly food inflation, coming back to your thalinomics as it is being talked about. So this, which has been for everybody, the key issue, the slowing down of the Indian growth story, all of that is not mentioned. And the other part of this, and that's an interesting part if you look at it also, they're not talking about manufacturing. They are saying service sector. Repeatedly, okay. the growth is going to go to service sector. You touched on a number of points. Let, let's, uh, let me uh, try and summarize some of the, some of the points that my, um, uh, in, in the limited time I've had to go through the economic survey, what it means. Firstly, let's stick to this issue of growth. They stick to the estimate of 5% growth. It's the slowest rate of growth in the last 10 years, till 2008-9. Secondly, it says that in the coming financial year, that is 2021, the year that begins on the 1st of April 2020, the GDP growth would go somewhere between 6 and 6.5%. And okay, good, nice, optimistic projection. It also says, and this is a hint toward what may come, when Nirmala Sitharaman presents her budget on Saturday, the 1st of February, the fiscal deficit may need to be relaxed to revive. Now, interestingly, the same uh, economic survey, which otherwise it says, you know, we have to believe in the market, goes back to Adam Smith and Adam Smith's epic treatise on modern economics written in 1736, talks about should we just creative destruction, everything, but says no, things are bad, therefore we need to increase the deficit. Now, what is interesting, it also says that private investment may get crowded on higher spending by the government on infrastructure. So, you know, it's in that sense sticking to the classic right-wing view on what needs to be done to revive the Indian economy without acknowledging what has gone wrong in the last six years. Now, on whatever, what is the crisis currently? Correct. Not even addressing For it. instance, it says you need to now reinforce Assemble in India with Make in India. And if you know, the, the president of India's speech also talked about how India has emerged as a major assembler of mobile phones. So, what I mean, I'll, I'll just give a quick statistic okay. on the issue, particularly of mobile phones. You know, the iPhone, for instance, is manufactured by Foxconn in China. Okay. And out of the total amount of money, they get $4 in profits, 4 to $7 in profits. And Roughly about two hundred dollars goes to Apple. So assembling gets you a very small fraction of the total value, and particularly for mobiles, where the really the value is in software, in the design, in the chips, and so on. You know what Dr. Subramaniam has said is he is at one level uh, saying things that is music to the ears of his political masters, and that is. The idea of wealth creation is rooted, you know, he says, in India's old and rich tradition, ranging from Kautilya's Arthashastra to Thiruvalur's Thirukula, which emphasizes ethical wealth creation. Fine, that's all very fine, and describes that as a noble human pursuit. At the time, when it comes to the chapter on crony capitalism, it doesn't mention names. All it says that the survey makes the case that the churn created by a healthy pro-business system generates greater wealth than a static pro-crony system. Note that the survey contrasts two systems. The arguments are not directed at any individual or entity. Instead, it argues for eliminating policies that undermines markets through government intervention, even where it's not necessary. For instance, it's fine to say that, you know, 
I mean, these are what are called motherhood statements. As the Americans would say, it's like motherhood and apple pie. Nobody can have any objections to it when you look at it blindly. But what is important is what is not said. For instance, the whole chapter on cronyism, for instance, doesn't talk about the telecom industry. I haven't gone through the details. Maybe inside the details uh, could be there. The, the whole, there's an entire chapter, which is, uh, which is chapter 10. And it's a very long and detailed chapter. And it starts with an anonymous quotation saying correlation is the basis of superstition and causation, the foundation of science. And then it spends a lot of time doing correlation. No, to debunking what this Dr. Subramaniam's predecessor, the other Dr. Subramaniam, that is Arvind Dr. Subramaniam. Arvind Subramaniam had suggested that we might be actually overestimate our rate of growth by about two and a half percentage points. And at the same time, it concludes. I mean, it says, yes, you know, uh, in this context, the setting up of the 28-member Standing Committee on Economic Statistics headed by India's former chief statistician is important. Nevertheless, carefully constructed evidence in the survey must be taken on board when assessing the quality of Indian data. Essentially, a lot of time and effort has been spent on trying to explain that actually, you know, we're not doing all that badly. I am yet to come across how do you explain the slowdown in electricity consumption? How do, how do you expect the slowdown in the rate of growth of diesel consumption? And what many economists are arguing that there is no, I mean, if your economy is actually growing at 4.5% or even 5%, it doesn't explain the rates of growth or in certain areas the decline in the rates of growth of electricity production and consumption, and diesel, the rate of growth of diesel. So, I mean, there's a lot that perhaps I have to look at the fine print. Like at this juncture, I don't want to say very much. Yeah. Looking, at, we can only look at the big picture right yeah. now because yeah. it will yeah. need some time to de-parse all the things that have been said. But what is missing here are A, an explanation for the stagnation of the Indian economy and what government is going to do, except to say, quantitative easing, but reduce, that the deficit be, would be allowed to grow. That is one thing said in a negative way rather than the positive way. Secondly, helping business because again, you are not going to make interventions directly. You are going to really be pro-business that's and pro-market. That's what it says. And the third point, it does not seem to in, uh, address the issue that you have stagnation now combined with the relatively high rate of inflation, which you haven't seen for right. the past few years, including food inflation, Correct. which is a very important element. Now, I have to look at the fine print, but what is interesting is all the, once again, let's go back to the motherhood statements that are being made. Now, for instance, it says that we need more reforms to make it easier to do business, right? Underlining, what are these? Start new businesses, register property, pay taxes, enforce contracts, remove red tape at doors. Okay, again, excellent, all good things you're saying, but wait, then look carefully, it also says, the weak global growth has impacted India. It also says that the investment slowed down in the financial sector. So, you know, it's, it's at one level acknowledging the problems, but suggesting a series of measures which would actually take which would be just a repetition of the same policies. Now, standard again for wealth to be created. Mr. Modi, our Prime Minister, has said it has to be first created. Look at wealth creators with respect. Once again, he goes back to the way we have allegedly yeah, we talked about de de that. De de debunked yeah. all those yeah. things. Yes, we talked about that. But you know, Paraji, the other thing that it seems to miss out completely is that when you, for instance, decide to say. Uh, remove what are called controls and remove state sector, which is basically selling assets cheaply to others. If you do that and you provide the business, the so-called wealth creators with lots of funds from the banks, you will get an initial rise because of obviously there is money flowing into a sector, but it is not sustainable and it works out in terms of fall later, which is what we're seeing right now. And also the fact that there's a huge overhang of now debts, which the corporate houses are, uh, the wealth creators are failing to pay and are being continuously bailed out. Now, this part of the picture, which is what actually 
uh, Raghuram Rajan had raised, if you remember. In fact, that was one of the issues that was there. And even Arvind Subramaniam has talked about some of these issues. He, he, he talked crisis. about the twin balance sheet crisis. This is Raghuram Rajan's. And the, no, the, 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 this Arvind is Arvind Subramaniam saying you have a crisis in the balance sheet of banks as well as the large corporates. Instead, what they, they are arguing is actually it's a detailed and I must say a very sophisticated justification of all that they've done. So they said, no, no, we are not arguing that we don't need government intervention. But, you know, he, he talks specifically of uh, two instances, the uh, Essential Commodities Act. It neither brings down prices nor reduces price volatility. And then it comes to... Yeah, the, but you the, know, the, 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 the Commodities Act is really a the, 50s, 60s uh, creation when we had shortages. Right. right. And then it talks about the drug price control order of 2015, saying it's not helped. So in a way, he's basically going on to say that government intervention, eliminating such instances of needless government intervention, will enable competitive markets and thereby spur investments and growth. So far, we haven't seen that happen. Let's wait and watch. Let's look at the banking sector a little bit. In order to justify the recent decision taken to merge all the banks, he is critical of dwarfism in the banking sector. And at the same time, say, we need to improve governance in public sector banks, need for more disclosure of information, to build trust, etc. Do you know what the banks have been disclosing in the balance sheet and then what the RBI has been saying? There's a huge gap. And, and this concerns not just India's largest bank, uh, the State Bank of India, but you know, a whole lot of banks which are financially in a mess. So what also is, private banks. Of course, like Yes Bank. <clears throat> so in a sense, what we are seeing is that the modest endeavor of the economic survey of 1890 is using principles of behavioral economics <laughs> as instruments of economic policy to have insights about human behavior. And that's the justification for presenting what he called thalinomics. And but, his, but, but, yes. I'm going to interrupt this whole point. If you remember, uh, behavioral economics can lead to what, what he did self, in itself debunks correlations being mistaken for call it, you know, actually causation. So if you talk about behavioral economics, it's really correlations that you'll be looking at and not any analytical model of course. Let, of let, let, let's, wait, let's wait and watch and go through the fine print in greater detail if this Dr. Krishnamurti Subramaniam is justified in arguing, as he said in the conclusion of the preface right up front, where he says, the economic survey has made a sincere effort to live up to the expectation of being an indispensable guide for following, understanding and thinking about the Indian economy. I'm sure when you look at the fine print, when you look at the statistics, you, you'll find that those statistics don't always, would not necessarily paint you a very rosy picture or, or, or a bright picture of the current state of India's economy. Thank you, Parajay. I think I'm going to end with this, what you just now said, that the economic survey became a humble attempt to craft a framework of policies. I think they have much to be humble about if we look at what they have presented. Thank you very much, Paul Jones, for being with us. This is all the time we have for today for this click. Do keep watching this click and look at our economic survey follow-ups that we're going to do as we get more details of the same.